Um, I'm here to talk about networking for containers. Uh, this isn't only just about containers. Uh, a lot of this will look very familiar if you've uh, seen anything with um, uh, virtualization setups. And so these are not what slides were not what I was expecting. <coughs> okay, so uh, who am I? Um, yes, there we go. Uh, face behind Dogger.io, where I've uh, tried to document all the low-level stuff behind containers um, and try and get people to uh, build things other than Docker. Um, probably the funniest thing about this was uh, the thing that got me into containers originally was uh, I got really, really badly fed up with OpenVZ and thought I could do a lot better with how the tools were designed from a usability point of view. Um, and I feel I succeeded on that point. But uh, yeah, so I've been playing with containers since about 2010. Um, the uh, talk here is mainly if you want to implement your own LXC or Docker, uh, or if you have a slight interest in networking. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of time, so I'm not going to be able to go in depth, but um, I should be able to answer some questions. Um, I'm not an expert on every aspect of networking, um, but I'll try my best or point you in the right direction. Um, I do have uh, more in-depth posts on my blog, which I'll link to at the end. Um, the things I'll be covering here are uh, what you normally see on a day-to-day -day basis in most setups, and uh, some of the newer stuff that uh, is highly relevant to containers on the right-hand side. So, I mean, th this stuff here on the uh, left, the bridges and VLANs, I mostly assume you're fairly familiar with uh, and deal with on a regular basis, but uh, it's worth touching on them um, because they uh, all build together along with the um, stuff on the right here uh, to come up with the final solution. So, um, I mean, if you log into a machine, a virtualization host these days, uh, you'll probably see a, a networking setup fairly similar to this. Um, you'll have one more bridge devices. Um, they might be SDNs or they might be the traditional Linux bridge devices and uh, VMs attached to them. Um, if we pretend that these are contain uh, VMs one through to four are containers, uh, these lines are here uh, and here would be uh, virtual Ethernet pipes. Um, there's probably a couple of odd things here. Um, you can see this uh, VM0. Um, that's the Mac VLAN, which I'll be talking about later. Um, it's just important to note that um, in this picture here, it appears to be part of Bond0. And uh, why that is, it becomes relevant, uh, obvious uh, later. And uh, the VXLAN, of course, is not attached to anything, which I'll go into why that is later. But it's basically because the kernel is responsible for um, forwarding the packets onto the destination. So um, bonding, as I said, I'll only touch on this lightly, but uh, you get HA and you get more speed. Um, it's not a free lunch. There's some caveats there. Um, if one flow, for example, if you've got two links and you bond them together, you don't get a two gigabit link, you get two one gigabit links. So um, a single flow can't use go at two gigabits in speed. <coughs> uh, <coughs> traditionally, if you have more than um, one network device uh, or one in, in network interface on a machine, you'll typically want to bond them and connect them to your network, um, either for the, as I said, the HA or the speed increases. Um, if you've got a switch at the other end, there's uh, an actual protocol for that called uh, LACP, uh, which is used to negotiate the, uh, the bonding. Um, now, you typically uh, tag a VLAN off this. Um, uh, a VLAN is uh, just a traditional way to cut up a switch into uh, smaller parts, more usable parts, either for um, isolating networks or um, <coughs> reducing the broadcast domain. Um, and uh, basically come in uh, two, ta two forms. You've got your tagged and your untagged form. Um, and what this means is that um, from the perspective of a Linux machine, um, you've got what's known as uh, a native VLAN, which is an, any traffic going... Sorry, let me compose myself. The, you've got some... Uh, now I'm stuck. Uh, you've got some... The, uh, any traffic that goes out will be untagged. And then you can tag, um, you can bring up an interface that tags packets going out of it um, and encapsulates them in a VLAN header. Um, and this is for when you don't have a physical interface, but you want to have uh, access to all the VLANs via this one interface. So for example, um, rather than uh, having one interface um, in, say, a backup network and one on the primary network interface, you might bond both and then have the primary network and the bonded network come in via 
the, um, the bonded interface for high availability. Um, okay, the, probably the thing I like most about um, uh, these traditional features is this one's not very well known as uh, dummy interfaces. These are sort of like a, a loopback um, device which you can attach addresses to. Um, I've seen a lot of people add IP addresses to loopback devices, and I'm not typically a fan of that just because I normally expect my loopback to only have the, the one network on it, and I tend to skip over it in my output. Um, by having an explicit dummy device, it's very, very clear um, that it's a separate network to the loopback address. Uh, and there, there are some advantages, especially with multi-home hosts. Um, I've seen people put uh, service addresses on actual interfaces, and the problem with that is if that interface goes down, then you can't access the services on that interface. Um, if you put that IP address on the dummy interface, then even if um, an interface goes down, uh, those services are still accessible via the alternate port. Um, so that they're fun to play around with, um, and the great thing is you can take them up and down, just like a loopback device. I think um, the one thing you probably don't want to do in your machine is take down the loopback device, where, as with this you can. Um, and because they're, um, they appear as a device, uh, they get announced via BGP and OSPF, so it works nicely with um, being distributed through your network. Um, <clears throat> onto the uh, stuff that's really um, more relevant to the containers is uh, the bridges. Um, I mean, this is basic uh, software building block here uh, for networks. Um, as you can see here, it's right at the center, and everything's connecting to it. Um, these correspond very closely to the switches on your desk. They're literally a software implementation. Um, and when designing the, uh, the networks or, or the network design uh, on the hypervisor, the, um, you can think of it very much like designing a small network on your desk. Um, the one thing to watch out for with this is if you've got two interfaces on a machine, you don't want to plug both interfaces into the bridge. You might actually cause a switching loop. Um, and that does bad, bad things. Uh, but that's why the bond, there is a bonded interface. Um, you bond both interfaces together and then add that to the bridge. Um, you're probably familiar with this with uh, libvirtual Docker. Um, the biggest problem with uh, bridges um, and these sets up, setups is that uh, they're quite invasive to the, uh, the setup of your network. I don't know if anyone's accidentally um, installed uh, libvirt on their uh, laptops and had their entire networking change. Um, it can be quite annoying to undo that change. Um, <clears throat> until recently, uh, with uh, the Mac VLAN, it wasn't actually uh, easy or possible for uh, <coughs> virtual machines to just directly use your, the network card on your machine. Um, you'd actually have to have uh, uh, this bridge device in between it uh, for it to get to a uh, access to the, uh, the real world or the real internet. Um, so, I mean, if you've got uh, a virtual switching device like that, you, of course, can need virtual cables. And uh, th this forms, uh, or this is exactly what a v virtual Ethernet pipe is. Um, packets go in one end, come out the other. Um, the link detection thing here is nice in that if one end of the link is down, <coughs> um, you can see it in the, the, uh, the link detection. Um, I've seen this used in a couple of ways, uh, but my favorite one is um, waiting for, or seeing if a container is ready for network traffic. Um, of course, it doesn't bring up the network uh, until about halfway through the boot process, um, and at that point, it's normally ready for uh, some sort of tra form of traffic. So you can just wait for that link to change and then uh, add it to the load balancer, for example. Um, the disadvantage of these virtual Ethernet devices is, uh, as it's not directly going at your Ethernet device, it's going through a couple of intermediate devices. In this case, the bridge it's connected to. Uh, there is a bit of performance overhead. Um, this is not really much of an issue in practice. Um, most machines can push a gigabit. Uh, but say you're doing <coughs> pushing 10 or 40 gigabits of traffic out of your machine, that's when you really start to notice it, uh, and it manifests as um, CPU, um, uh, high CPU, um, normally with most of that time spent in the kernel uh, rather than your applications. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's probably the simplest way to do it. You, you stick one end in your container uh, and one in a, end in a bridge and uh, be done with it. The uh, counterpart to this is the, uh, the new Mac, Mac VLAN. Um, and like a VLAN, um, whereas a VLAN splits up a switch, this uh, actually splits up uh, a network interface on your machine. Um, and at first, I, I couldn't think of a good reason to use this. Um, and then I was playing around with um, 
uh, Libverse uh, on my machine and uh, Vert Manager. And it actually comes with the option to, um, uh, rather than set up a bridge network and then um, swap all your networking over to it, uh, just reuse the main interface on your machine so you don't have to change your networking layout at all, which was, which was really kind of nice. Um, but the, possibly the best thing about Mac VLAN and the, the major reason why you'd want to be using this in a uh, container setup is if you have a container that's ultra high performance or needs ultra low latency, um, because it's a, um, effectively uh, an alias of um, one of the main interfaces on your machine and it's not going via the bridge, you've got the lower overheads. Um, the, unfortunately, uh, it's not um, something you can just give to all your um, containers. There are some limitations in hardware. Uh, it actually uses the, uh, the MAC filtering on your network cards. And a lot of network cards don't have a lot of MAC filtering um, slots available. So, I mean, you can look at probably doing 10 um, MAC VLAN um, devices um, on a single interface before you run into issues. And it'll still work. Um, however, what you'll notice is it'll actually fall back to software. Uh, it'll switch to promiscuous mode and then um, do the Mac filtering in software. And once again, you'll notice that the, uh, your machine spends a lot of time in the kernel um, spinning its wheels. Um, there, it actually comes in two forms as well. Um, the, there's a traditional one where you just get an interface, which you can then insert into a container. Uh, the other one is a, um, you can bind it to a file descriptor and then it acts like a, a tap or a tunnel. So if you need um, to uh, move your packets to another machine and um, you want to um, do some sort of SDN, you could also conceivably put one end uh, or you can put the Mac VLAN in the container and then read from the, um, the tap or tunnel device and uh, move it somewhere else on the network. Uh, I definitely don't recommend that. Um, there are alternatives to that. And probably the last thing I need to say about Mac VLAN is um, there are a couple of modes for it. Um, there um, is, in the standard mode, if you're sending traffic out the Mac VLAN interface and it's destined for another machine on um, the same machine, uh, the kernel won't actually send it out the network card. It'll just short circuit it internally. Uh, there is another mode known as hairpin mode. Uh, where, there, where it will always force the network packet to go out the network interface and expect the switch to send it back. Uh, and the reason you might want to do this is if you're in um, uh, an envir environment that's highly regulated and there's network uh, ACLs that need to be enforced. So you can still have your containers um, and still have the network AC traditional network ACLs. Um, but of course the disadvantage is because it's going out the network interface there, uh, you're going to have issues with bandwidth. Um, that, that leads, most of everything up till now has pretty much been traditional static networking. Um, you very quickly hit a point um, where you want to move things around or move hosts around and the networking of your containers doesn't necessarily reflect that of your hardware layout and things become complex. Um, this, this is probably most obvious with VLANs where if you want to move, um, if you want to add a VLAN you've suddenly got to log into all switches in between. And if you move a um, uh, machine between hosts, you've got to then swap all, log in again and swap everything. Uh, overlay networks really help to uh, alleviate that. They basically allow you to uh, lay a network that you, uh, looks however you want it to look uh, on top of a real physical network. And probably the best thing about this is that there's significantly lower friction. Uh, I did mention that about the VLANs, but the provisioning of the VLANs is uh, a lot simpler in that case. You just basically join the two hosts and then that's it. Um, without having to log into any intermediate switches. Um, one of the traditional ways to implement this is uh, with VXLAN, which is basically, you could think of it as a cable cut in half that still works. So you put uh, one end in a container on one host and one end in a container on another host, and they're magically still transmitting packets to each other. Um, probably one of the biggest advantages here is, unlike VLANs, they can go uh, over the internet. So if you have a look here, VLAN, uh, VXLAN 30 and VXLAN 40, um, with a traditional VLAN setup, uh, you could only have a VLAN between host A and B, because there's a router in between, um, or a VLAN between host C and D and A. E. Uh, the VXLAN will actually allow you to extend it over the router. And I mean, the, these two machines could be in one data center and these other machines could be in another data center. So I mean, immediately you start to gain more flexibility um, in how you lay out machines and where you actually place the machines themselves. 
Um, the other thing that's really, really nice is that uh, VXLAN brings in 24 bits uh, for VLANs rather than the 12. Um, I'm not running 4,096 VLANs, and I wish I had 4,096 customers to play with uh, at home, but uh, I don't. Uh, but it's still nice that they've ex extended it. Um, so, I, I mean, the, the first thing that comes up whenever you talk about anything like this is um, SDN. Um, and SDN is um, basically software that controls the flow of packets through your network. Um, the, it's very, very wide and very, very vague. Um, but that, that's it. The, you can do a lot of uh, interesting things with it. Um, you can switch traffic around, congested links if you can identify them. Uh, you can provide isolation and VLAN like functionality um, without implementing VXLAN, although I found that most people tag um, the packets with VXLAN just to make it easier to identify. Um, and basically, if you can think of it, you can do it. I mean, you could do firewalling or um, ACLs or some other magic I haven't thought of. Um, I've seen bandwidth reservation as well. So, I mean, in the case of um, rerouting your traffic, imagine here, you've got a congested link here. Um, your management plane would identify that that link's congested and reroute the, uh, the traffic fire switches four and five here, um, which are uncongested, uh, to better balance the, uh, the traffic on your network. Um, this is not easy to deploy. Um, it's not something you can roll out um, uh, just onto an existing network. Um, but uh, as you start implementing things like VXLAN and the uh, container networking stuff, um, this seems to come up again and again very, very early on in the process. So um, SDN is normally split into two halves. You've got the um, parts doing the actual uh, hardware switching and the ones making the software control decisions. And the protocol for these two parts that speak together uh, is, uh, that speak to each other is known as OpenFlow. Uh, you don't actually have to know much about OpenFlow, um, other than both parts should support it. If something doesn't, um, don't use it. And that there's uh, three versions, 1.2, 1.1, um, 1 and 1.3. Um, if you're looking for an example, I'm not going to touch on the, uh, the software control plans, mainly the hardware stuff, but um, if you're looking for an example of how to control the, uh, the flows themselves and implement the software, I'd recommend something uh, like Ryu. Um, so open vSwitch is uh, an SDN on the actual machine itself. It looks like a bridge device. Uh, it has a user space daemon um, that is basically the SDN um, packet control thing. Um, and if a kernel has a route, it routes it directly. Otherwise, it asks a user space program. Um, it can speak OpenFlow, so it can coordinate multiple machines as well. So you can start off with open vSwitch and switch to OpenFlow later. Um, now I'm actually running out of time. and um, so I'll have to skip that page, but um, did anyone have any questions? Probably not. <laughs> can, uh, Jamie Wilkinson, please come up if he's here. Yep, cool.